Perhaps it's a mistake that they are in different academic departments, different disciplines, different communities. Um, uh, 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 it, it, it's um, maybe they feed each other. History is, after all, a, 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 f a form of literature. It is one of the arts, as has been pointed out. Um, the uh, Clio, the muse of history, uh, is as much a muse as Irato was the muse of love poetry, and uh, 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 another of the muses was, of course, Calliope, the muse of epic poetry. And in fact, nobody pointed out that Calliope is the chief of the muses. Uh, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about that and make a kind of, um, uh, just as a sort of uh, little joke, to have a sort of little um, friendly and playful competition, let's say, with history. History has uh, on its side, you know, its, uh, its immense uh, usefulness and its wonderful uh, be, uh, ability to appeal to the, uh, to the facts and all of that. But um, Philip Sidney said something wo wonderful once. He said, uh, uh, the poet, nothing lieth, for he nothing affirmeth. <laughs> um, and there may be a, uh, that may be a path to a certain kind of truth, and I want to get at some of that. Um, history, of course, means two different things. It means what actually happened, but it also means the more or less true story we tell about what, about what happened, and we've been talking about that a great deal. The earliest and most powerful stories about what happened are, in fact, the great epics of humankind. And they're the epics of humankind. Um, that, that is, uh, to a large extent, we have thought of epic as being something that is... Um, uh, you know, if we're going to be really, uh, really purist about it, epic is, is the Odyssey and the Iliad, and if we're going to be a little bit less purist about it, we'll say the Odyssey, the Iliad, and the Aeneid, and, and then, then, we, th then we start adding, adding some things like, uh, uh, you know, is the Divine Comedy, well, uh, and then, we, uh, then, then things like the Song of Roland, or, or, the, the, or Beowulf, or... Uh, you know, or uh, uh, Paradise Lost, uh, uh, and then sort of, you know, the the uh, is the the Lithuanian epic uh, Lakplesis, and and the uh, the Kalevala, the Finnish epic, and and then we find more and more and more epics. Um, so in fact, uh, rather like the term tragedy, which had to be expanded when the Roman plays came along, and then when the Shakespearean plays ca yeah, came along, it's something that, uh, that expands uh, and, and grows. Uh, uh, a, a, and that's one of the things that a genre does. An epic, though, is not just a story about what happened. It's a happening in itself. And it's not just a happening, but a potent cause of historical events. The uh, uh, recent and continuing troubles in the, in the Balkans um, could almost be described as a continued uh, dis difference over how to interpret the epic of Ko Kosovo. Um, The, uh, in, the, in a couple of the Mayan revolutions, use the Popol Vuh, the ancient Mayan epic, as uh, as a as a kind of, as a rallying call. Um, the composition of an epic is often the founding of a city or its equivalent. By by equivalent, I mean enough people related in enough socioeconomic ways to make up a, a kind of communicating population. And when you get that for long enough, then an epic is going to appear. And this sounds like sort of one of these awful, uh, awful sort of historic, historical rules. It's not really a rule, but it's a sort of tendency. It's like if you get a, uh, something that is close enough to a city with the necessity for 
uh, <coughs> large-scale agriculture, you're probably going to have pyramids. It's sort of like that. Um, in fact, an epic, I think, is as, as essential to a city's being as its temple, its walls, its irrigation system, its political legal structure, and so on. And, of course, the great biblical epics, Genesis and Exodus, are classic examples. Uh, Njal's saga in Iceland, which is really about the formation of Iceland as a, 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 as a, 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 as a nation. Uh, I mentioned the Popol Vuh, the Mahabharata is fundamental to, uh, to the... Uh, to the nature of being Indian. Um, uh, the, the Japanese heike, the, the Henriad of, of Shakespeare, and of course the Odyssey, the Iliad, and the, and the Aeneid. History creates literature, certainly. Literature is, a, is something that was created and we tell, uh, we have history about it. But literature, especially epic, creates history. It's not just an account of something, it's a doing of something. It's almost like a sacrament. <laughs> it's a, uh, what is it, an uh, outward and visible sign of an inward and invisible grace or something like that, or a reality. Uh, so let me give a basic model for the history of literature. At the beginning, what you have is myth, and usually just oral, um, which is a, yeah, has fundamental themes. Uh, Joseph Campbell writes about it and so on. A huge variety of different historical anecdotes, legends, symbols, allegories, tales, parables, and so on. And it's based on the tribe. It's based on a kind of a natural grouping of people. That's that that was probably going up to about three hundred thousand years ago. I mean, we're probably doing that f for th about three hundred thousand years. Um, and then somewhere before or around 7,000 years ago, you began to get epic. Once you began to get something like a city, then what happens is that the fundamental themes of myth, enhanced by, it, the emer by emergent universal themes, um, uh, begin to be shaped. And they sh they're shaped as a big story, combining many local tribal myths and, and histories and legends. Uh, it's both a description of the founding of the city and a foundational document and act of foundation. It usually includes a creation myth and city founding, sometimes in reverse in the case of the tragic epics. There are epics which essentially describe what the city is, what the civilization is, by having a tragic and terrible war that destroys it. And so you see it get destroyed bit by bit by bit, peeling away the layers that make the civilization until you get back down to pretty much to the state of nature. And the state of nature is very important, I think, in Epic. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, uh, and so examples are uh, the, you know, obviously the Iliad, uh, the Japanese heike, the Chinese uh, poem, The Three Kingdoms, um, uh, the, uh, uh, in some ways you could say, uh, the Nyal Saga, um, the great, the great, uh, uh, I, I, my, I say that's an epic, and um, uh, it fulfills a lot of the epic uh, um, uh, formulae, which I will talk about later. Um, and then what happens is the emergence from epic of what one might call eclogic genres, genres that are based on close reading of epic and, close and a thinking about epic, in which various aspects of it are singled out and used as models for new literary ventures, uh, pastoral literature and um, uh, lyric, lyric literature, um, even philosophical literature, you know, like if you think of uh, um, Hesiod and Heraclitus and Lucretius and maybe the Book of Wisdom and the Upanishads and so on. And then you get um, uh, prose. You get the emergence of prose. And with prose, you have, of course, the novel, the treatise, the history, 
and all the other modern forms. And I, I'm adding the history to that uh, because its uh, history is bound to um, more or less ascertainable facts. Um, up to now, uh, literature has been mostly, uh, up to this point, literature had been mostly in poetic verse, as its claim, as, claim was that it is important enough to commit to memory. And the way you commit something, the way you write to commit, when you compose to commit to me memory, then you do it in, in, in meter and, ry and sometimes rhyme. Since by now writing and later printing exist, Human memory is no longer necessary for the preservation of archives. But as Plato noted, what is lost is some of the transformative effect on the brain that memorization creates. And you guys all know about that. Um, well, epic. Epic is not just a Western phenomenon, as I said. Um, in thinking about, in, in the research that I did on epic for, for this book, which takes about 60 epics and finds about 60 themes that are more or less in common among, among them with you know, some exceptions here and there, um, it, it, it looks as if we, it, it, we have the basis for a conception of what you might call a world classicism or what I, said bef uh, what I mentioned before as a, a natural classicism as we learn more about the riches of other cultures and literatures. Um, and you have before you, if, the, if, if there are enough copies to go around, my list of, of epics um, from all over the world. Um, and from, you know, from... Uh, I've, since I put this together, and this is just a, a sketch, and I should have updated it and revised it, I found a, a, a number more, but um, essentially we're talking about, uh, you know, if we're going to talk about classical education, we might start thinking about classical education uh, at, for, for human beings. And this is an idea which I think um, is, uh, sits uncomfortably beside the people who want our classicism to be about our culture. Uh, the West, and those who, those who think that the idea of, of anything classical or anything foundational or, or anything fundamental is, 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 uh, is, uh, uh, is false. It's another, it's another, it's a different idea. That there's a world classicism. And so this is uh, one uh, uh, point I sort of wanted to make. Um, I want to talk both today and tomorrow about um, it, w what are these characteristics that are in common, or largely in common among these, these epics. By the way, one of the things that happens with epic is that generally a, re a religion arises out of it. Clearly, a Judaism arises out of the stories of Genesis and Exodus. Um, Clearly, uh, you know, if, you think, if you think of Greek culture, um, Greek culture comes together, is, is sort of formulated into, into one thing by, by Homer. Um, as we now know from good Greek scholarship, Homer is collecting stuff from all <coughs> kinds of different bits and pieces of the Greek experience and also experience from other cultures. A lot of it comes out of Egypt, people are now saying, and so on. So it's, it's, it's a collecting together of a whole lot of things. And generally, a classicism is, uh, emerges when you have a, a really fertile mixing among lots of different cultures uh, that, that are forced to come together in some way because um, you can't have a bunch of... Uh, there's no way that you can make a city out of a bunch of warring tribes. So what you need is a story that includes all the big stories in all the different tribes. That, that gives an explanation of how the tribes came together, how the 12 tribes of, 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 of Israel came together, you know, how, the, uh, how, how the, uh, the, the, the Mayan tribes came together, uh, how, the, uh, um, uh, uh, how, how the Greek uh, city-states came together to form the Hellenes, you know. Um, 
And so it's uh, it, 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 uh, the, the the classical is a continuing, therefore a continuing and uh, radical. Um, uh, sort of, it's a sort of continuing and radical revolution in itself. Um, what is epic about? Basically, I, I, I maintain in my book uh, that it's the human answer to the question, how did we become human? Clearly, we are animals. Why are humans different from other animals? And how did the animals we are become human? We know from looking at babies that they're little different from animals, but turn into full adult, adult human beings. Can we infer that the history of our whole kind is similar? And what are the stages of the emergence of that human essence? Knowledge, self-consciousness, shame, sin, awe, love, duty, heroism, tragedy. Epic is evolutionary science before we had science, an allegorical or parabolic attempt to describe a process that we half remember and half infer. Uh, we do know now that so many stories go back not just hundreds of years, but thousands of years, and maybe further back. Uh, the, the one of the great epic themes, which I'll talk about later, maybe next time, maybe tomorrow, is the theme of the, the beast man, uh, the the the, the the, the human who hasn't quite got to be human yet is the pre-human man. And um, uh, the, the, uh, we can see that idea already in the Trois Frères uh, uh, cave painting of the dancing shaman with the head of a, of a deer. And the, there are figures like that in many different parts of the world where we're sort of defamiliarizing de ourselves with our humanity and sort of pointing out that, yeah, we're sort of animals too, but we're not. How did we get from being animals to being human? And this is also related to how did we grow up? Have I run out of time? Two minutes. I've run out of time. I was going to read you a bit of one of my epics, but maybe I have to stay, save that for tomorrow. I'll read you a little tiny bit. Uh, this, is, um, this is a piece from my epic about the terraforming of Mars and the gardening of the, of the planet uh, once it's been given a, a breathable atmosphere. And my epics are about the future and not the past, but they're nevertheless about how, how did we become human. Um, uh, it is a matter very practical. The gardening of crater planetscapes Few books record its arts and its techniques, yet Cicero's landscape gardeners would know when they laid out his grounds by Lake Lucrino and the patricians of the Auburn Hills who set their villas by the crater lakes of Nemi and Albano clad in vines and let their grottos give a prospect on a glimmering water framed in shady pines. They'd be worth asking if she might invoke their gentle haughty shades for such discourse. Yet they passed on their wisdom as the Greeks did to the Romans and the Romans to the masters of the Renaissance. They taught the gardeners of England how to shape a sylvan walk to imitate the trials of Hercules or sharp Odysseus, instruct a guest Aeneas how to choose the way of piety and fortitude, and they in turn taught the Americans the gardens of Dumbarton Oaks and those the DuPonts planted outside Wilmington carried the same hermetic wisdom on across the oceans and the garden worlds that glitter in a necklace round the sun bear the same history, the land of shades transformed to paradise, to fairyland, to purify the dreaming of the tribe. It seems that Beatrice must write the book, though, and reveal its secret name as Mars. <laughs> uh, I'm David Rothman. It's an honor and a privilege to be here with these panelists in particular. When I introduce uh, Fred, I often say his brain should be declared a national park. <laughs> uh, he, I think he knows, uh, he, he, he is so extraordinary. In fact, 
the book which he was reading from was uh, assigned to astronauts at NASA, uh, by NASA, to help because it was uh, considered to be such an uh, appropriate representation of what it might be like to terraform uh, a planet, which I think is pretty exciting. And Mark is uh, great. I haven't, we haven't been on a panel together in a while. I think Mark Bauerlein is one of the most gifted critics and social thinkers out there right now, and it's a real privilege to be here. And uh, he was modest in introducing himself, but uh, I, think, I think he just gets up and writes about two, two or 3,000 publishable words every morning. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> So I wanted to finish, complete your thought, which you didn't quite have time to do, which was that, uh, you know, human, human beings stopped being uh, animals and started being animals when they learned how to tell jokes. Isn't that it? <laughs> <laughs> right. among, but, other among other things. <laughs> so uh, how many of you are teachers? Yeah. How many of you are administrators? OK, get out, you guys. <laughs> no, really, it's OK. I'm an administrator. Some of my best friends are administrators. How many people teach or have taught uh, K or, or pre-K uh, five or six? Yeah. And middle school? Oh, really? And high school? That's great. I'm, uh, I'm going to try to um, give you something I hope that you can use today, no matter uh, which level you're teaching at. And I have taught at all of these levels, including also the undergraduate level and the graduate level. I ran a graduate program in creative writing and have written curriculum. And, uh, um, and uh, because you're teachers, I, know you're, I hope you are looking for something useful, and I'm going to try to, to provide you with that. Um, 15 minutes, right? Yeah. OK. The, uh, the subject is you know, literature across time. And uh, I hope that my little talk fulfills that in, in two ways, uh, because it's literature in time, but also across time. Uh, and I'm in, as opposed to focusing on very large subjects, I'm going to talk about something much more exciting, which is prosody handbooks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> very exciting. I know you're all thinking now, why didn't I get that cavity filled this afternoon? <laughs> but, the, but in fact, uh, <laughs> they are tremendously exciting and tremendously important. And their fate is quite uh, interesting in modern pedagogy at all levels. We're going to talk about that. Uh, the, the, uh, I think it's be important to begin by defining terms and defining the subject. Uh, prosody is the more old-fashioned term. It was appropriated by the linguists. Do I? I don't have to hold that up, do I? Is that OK? Um, if you could just hold it's it. It's a little hard. I want to gesticulate. I'm Mediterranean. I, <laughs> I, I can't. With OK, it. if you just set it on the podium, that should be fine. Here, OK, that's good. Here, I'll, I'll try to do it like that. Sorry, I didn't pick it up. The, uh, it's, that's the uh, sort of old-fashioned term, I suppose. It was, uh, of course, uh, a term that was created by poets before being appropriated by philosophers, critics, and linguists. Pros oida, that which exists in addition to an ode, the ode being the words, uh, that which exists in addition to it being the music, so the music of the words. In modern times, that term has been sort of appropriated by linguists to indicate the uh, contours of all natural speech, uh, which are tremendously important uh, to all, all languages and different in all languages. And we, tend to, we now often use the word versification, referring to the poetic quality of creating verses and how we do that. This is a, one of the perennial and tremendously important subjects of poetry, as far as I can tell, universally. There's a huge literature on it in Russian, in Arabic, in Farsi, in uh, every language that I've ever encountered. The debates over Hebrew versification went on for thousands of years before in the 18th century, <coughs> 1770s, I believe, a man named Bishop Louth uh, figured out how Hebrew prosody actually worked. Debates which were then recapitulated in, the, in, in very fiery exchanges over the work of Whitman, who imitates it in English. Uh, but Leaving all of that aside, let's try to just get at the heart of what the subject is, because it's particularly difficult to define. Because it's not really something uh, that one um, can define with words. Writers tend to think of everything that they do as having meaning and being definable semantically. But it's important to remember, and this is crucial, and this is where I'm going to begin to, I hope, give you something that's useful. It's important to remember that poems not only say things, but crucially, they also do things. And if we don't grasp what poems do, we will never be able to 
teach them well or even understand them. And to coin a distinction, I would say what we're talking about is the difference between meaning and meaningfulness. And prosody is about meaningfulness. And it's extremely difficult to say what prosody means, even though one can feel its meaningfulness. So there's a really easy example of this that I've developed to use. And there, we could do any number of them. I'm going to recite for you a, a well-known poem by uh, Robert Frost. Uh, it's a poem he wrote apparently when he was on his way home and he was a poor poet and he didn't even have enough money to buy his children a Christmas present. And that was one of the, that's a hypothetical basis for the poem. I think I know whose woods these are. Though his house is in the village, he will not see me stopping here to watch the snow fill up his woods. <laughs> Whoops. So I've kept the meter, actually. I haven't even disturbed the meter, but I have disturbed something else. What I've done is I've removed Frost's sly hyperbaton. And the hyperbaton is, uh, is uh, like, uh, it is speaking like Yoda that I am. <laughs> Yoda always speaks in hyperbaton, meaning the rhetorical figure whereby words don't necessarily appear in the, in the order that they would appear in English, which is an analytical language, mean, meaning it depends on word order. Obviously, this is wonderful. Everybody here teaches some Latin, so you know. In English, the girl loves the farmer is very different from the farmer loves the girl. The farmer hopes that the girl loves the farmer, but she, she may not. She probably doesn't. We never get to find out. Even. It's always the farmer loves the girl, and the girl's saying, oh, fine. But obviously, in Latin, you could say agricola ama puelam or puelam ama agricola, and it would mean exactly the same thing because of the inflections. It's a synthetic language. English began as a synthetic language but uh, turned into an analytical language. Uh, and uh, Old English is, is a synthetic language. So uh, the farmer loves the girl is very different from the girl loves the farmer because the inflections aren't there. And it's the word order that matters. So Frost has very cunningly used some of this. And when you remove it, however, the poem pops like a soap bubble because the poem doesn't go, I think I know whose woods these are. It goes, whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. You will not see me stopping. see me stopping here to watch the snow fill up his woods. You can hear the difference, right? One's a postcard. One's one of the greatest poems ever written by an American. Uh, <laughs> the interesting thing is, of course, that if you were to diagram the sentences, would there be any difference? There's no semantic difference whatsoever. <coughs> Prosody, versification. The, poem, the words are doing something when they've been organized in this way that they cannot do, that one cannot, <coughs> one would seek in vain to describe uh, what is happening in that poem and why it has that effect on us if one cannot at some level describe what the words are doing. And of course what I've removed is the rhyme. Good luck saying what rhyme means. Uh, two good, words kissing. Yeah, two words kissing. That's what it does. That's not what it means. The, uh, David Mason, big troublemaker, this guy. <laughs> the former poet laureate of Colorado. And one of the, most, one of the greatest poets alive, I think. The, uh, uh, you know, what does it mean to say, no, though, snow? It could mean anything. Whose woods these are? Heck, I don't know. You know uh, I'd, I'd like to steal his horses, though. I mean, <laughs> they, 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 they don't mean anything in and of themselves. He will not see me stopping here, but he'll know when his horses go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you could do anything. You know, their, their meaning is not predetermined. And in fact, if we seek for their meaning, Instead of looking at their meaningfulness and what they do, we're going to be in, in a lot of trouble because we'll never get where we want to be. So all I would suggest that prosody and versification are absolutely crucial and, and absolutely essential to what we're trying to do when we teach young people poetry, even if they're not going to be um, poets, just as we teach mathematics to people who are not necessarily going to be mathematicians or music to people who are not necessarily going to be musicians. We would never dream of teaching music if, uh, assuming it isn't just a music history course, without, of course, trying to help people to play a little bit of it and understand it. So the way that, the first way that this is literature across time is that, of course, it's pretty difficult to have prosody without time because you have to have it proceeding through time. It has to be embodied in time. And it's very important. And th this is why, as Dana Joy and many others have pointed out, and as I agree, it's really quite important to retain the, the practice of memorization and recitation, or at least of reading aloud. 
putting the poems, if you can, into time, into the air and into time. That simple action pedagogically is something that I encourage you to do at every single level. If you're, at high, if you're doing, working at the high school level, how many of you know about Poetry Out Loud, the National High School Recitation Project? Talk with me afterwards, I'll fill you in. It's an NEA uh, project, it's fantastic. Children, uh, high school kids um, competing and reciting well-known poems from memory. It's absolutely wonderful. And Dave and I have been very involved in that in Colorado. The other, so that's one aspect. The other aspect is what has happened to our pedagogy, which is why, of course, I wrote a, I've written a poetry handbook, a textbook. And uh, what's happened, basically, is that I, I and I, I now agree with the great scholar Norman Fruman, the critic of Coleridge, who argues this really began with the new critics who came in in the 40s and wanted to displace an older generation of bell lettrists and brought in a very high-powered, basically, a, I would call it a hermeneutic approach to literature where, frankly, they were primarily concerned with describing the meaning of poems, the meanings of poems, not appreciating them, but describing their meanings. And these were very fine writers. Many of them were very fine poets. John Crow Ransom, an extraordinary critic and scholar. Uh, but the, the fallout from that over time, Fruman argues very convincingly, is uh, that we, we wound up with a, with a kind of critical culture and a pedagogical culture where we were overemphasizing the meanings of poems and losing sight of some of those inarticulable things that we can feel that are meaningful that um, are much harder to describe because as soon as you put them into words, it seems to sort of slip away like a, like a uh, greased watermelon. So I want to read, I, read I, I went and I read, I actually did go and assemble about 175 poetry handbooks over time. I don't have them all, but I have a lot of them. And um, you know what's in, I'm going to read you a little, just a page or two of this. Yeah, we have time. Um, that rings a bell. The, uh, so Mary, here's a quote from Mary, Mary Oliver, um, where she, uh, Acquaintance with the main body of English poetry is absolutely essential. It is clearly the whole cake. While well, what has been written in the last hundred years or so without meter is no more than an icing. And indeed, and this is primarily a free verse poet, and indeed I do not really mean an acquaintanceship. I mean an engrossed and able affinity with metrical verse. To be without this felt sensitivity to a poem as a structure of lines and rhythmic energy and repetitive sound is to be forever less equipped less deft than the poet who dreams of making a new thing can afford to be. The poets say this again and again and again. And yet, there's a whole group of these poetry handbooks, many of which are quite powerful, or popular rather, which says, you know, please uh, don't, just don't pay any attention to that meter over in the corner. Many of these works take, and I'm going to just read a, about a, two pages here. Many of these works take an organicist and ultra-romantic approach. This is where I get to snarl a little bit. Uh, to take a, an organicist and ultra-romantic approach to poetic composition, which presumably derives in its longest view from weak misreadings of Emerson by way of Wordsworth and Rousseau. While most of the authors do have compelling things to say about the sources of inspiration and strategies for composition and the generation of content, there is generally a strong underlying polemic in many such works against the teaching, study, and use of traditional metrics and verse form as restrictive and spiritually debilitating. A few examples. In The Mind's Eye, A Guide to Writing Poetry uh, by Kevin Clark, he writes that most poets believe that the imagination can catalyze magically surprising language without the presence of predetermined structures. Note the ancient canard that metrical forms have predetermined structures, whereas free verse poems do not, which they do if they're good. While Clark claims to be even-handed, writing that skilled formal poets can use the demands of form to innovate, he devotes a very short amount of time to talking about this. Um, and then the titles are typical uh, of the chapters. Conflict and transformation. Do poems have plot? Empathy and creativity. Poetry and eros, and so on. You notice they're all based in subjects. They're all about something. Poems, you know, don't have to be about a lot. Um, this is a very common trend. Some are even more aggressive in their criticisms in uh, Creating Poetry, a book by John Drury from 1991. He concludes, the problem with many fixed forms, by which he means meter, is that they are so rigid they don't give the poetic imagination much freedom or provocation. They are more for puzzle maker, the ingenious turner of phrases. Uh, this, a lot of this descends from modern poetics, where uh, poets became so envious of the prose writers, I think, that following Robert Creeley and Charles Olson, they said, you know, 
Form is only extension of content. Content always comes first. So I'm here to suggest that that isn't true and that you should seek out the good handbooks by people like John Hollander uh, and Stephen Fry and the Book of Forms by Lewis Turco, and John Hollander's Rhymes Reason and several others. And I have about two minutes, I think. So I want to, uh, I could go on with these examples. They're legion. I would be suspicious when somebody ever starts to tell you that the way to teach poetry and the way to think about poetry and the way to present poetry is only to focus on its meaning. Think about its meaningfulness. Think about its music. The music is the kiss, is the two words kissing. Um, you wouldn't do that when you're eating an apple. You wouldn't hold it up and say, you know, it tastes good, but what does it mean? <laughs> it's a, those are my shoes, but what do they mean? <laughs> you know, I, it's the same question. Why wouldn't you just enjoy them? And that's a, actually a, a radical thing to say. It's a little bit disruptive. Let me give you one more example from Robert Frost that I particularly like. Let's see how many of you know this. I expect many of you do. Nature's first green is gold. Hardest you to hold. Her early leaves of flower. Oh, I love what, what a conference. Then leaves subsides to leaf. So he thinks he's So dawn goes. So dawn goes down today. Okay, how many syllables in every line? What's the meter? Short. Yeah, they're short. I'm afraid you're going to have to be a little more specific. It increases, right? Three. Three, right? First, and there are a bunch of reversals, and so in nature's first green is gold, her heart is huge to hold, her early leaves a flower, but only so, right? Got this? Y'all know it by heart. I think I cry. There's one line with five syllables. Which one is it? The last one, which is also the title. What's the missing syllable? Which one is missing? I'll give you a clue. It's an acephalous line. Which one is missing? <laughs> yeah, I told you we were going to do something. We're almost done. Promise. Which one is missing? I'm not going to tell you yet, man. No, you don't get to answer. <laughs> Her heart is. Listen to it. Listen, well, listen, listen, listen. The first syllable. Yeah. Her, nature's first green is gold. Her heart is huge. Her heart is huge to hold. Her early leaves a flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf goes down to leaf. Then leaf subsides to leaf. So Eden sank to grief. So dawn goes down today. Nothing gold can stay. It's a headless line. He said, was the first one, the unstressed one. Now here's a genius at work. Now I think this is true. People, you may scoff, scoff away, but I'll leave you with it. What's the word after the missing syllable? That is a genius. <laughs> Think about it. Uh, Frost does this all the time because he's that good. Uh, it would be impossible even to begin to have that conversation about what that might possibly mean if one couldn't first apprehend the meaningfulness of the music of the poem. Find a way to give your students that meaningfulness. It's OK to just have them spout rhymes and play games and feel the meaningful joy and beauty and delight of two words kissing or of meter or of rhythm. They want to do it anyways. One, two, buckle my shoe, three, four, shut the door, five, six. This gives me kicks. Thank you very much. <laughs>
and we do it throughout the semester, they get better at it, right? Memorization, memory is a muscle, right? You, you, you work it, you, you build it. And they like it, they definitely get past that. So the prosody is, is, is fun and just, you know, scansion exercises and so on. So th thank you uh, on, on that, you know, the focus on, on words and pronunciation. And, and then the big picture, you know, just telling students there are these great works. You know, we're not going to read them in this class. They're ancient. They have survived the ages. And big things are happening. You know, the epic, the epic hero, the epic events. And that I, I find that the, you know, the, the American 18-year-old, they, they want to feel like they are studying big things, right? They want the greatness. I'm going to college now. And they want to make contact with monuments. You know, powerful, big thing. The world is bigger for them. They're away from their homes for, for, for the first time for most of them. And they want to feel the world is opening for them. And, and I think that, that the scope of the epic, of the, of the ancient, the long lasting, is uh, something that hits them on a deep level. And, and it's hard for them. You guys prepare them for it. You know, that, that's what the great hearts, that's what the classical schools do. These are classics, and classics is a good word. Uh, and, and I think they're hungry for that, and a lot of students who don't have that end up envying those who, who did, because it's hard to do it on your own you know, when you're 30 years old. You know, who, reads, who, reads, who reads Paradiso you know, at, at age 30? On your own? That's going to be rare. Now, uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about a, a, a slightly different thing regarding literary history, right? Literary history. And the big point that I'll make, I'm only going to talk about 10 minutes and leave time for questions. The big point is that when you make your syllabi, even when you form units in the primary grades, that it's important when you teach literature that there is something of a story from work to work, right? You look, you look at the syllabus in, in your 12th grade English class, you see a plot somehow working, working through. Not, I mean, it could be something that, that, that may be more or less factitious. But to put the pieces into a structure of some kind for the students, one, it helps to remember, right? You position things within a narrative of some kind. People remember things better when the pieces are related in a causal or chronological or thematic fashion in, in some way. And the students will prefer that. And I'm going to give you an illustration that comes out of what Stanley Kurtz was talking about this morning. Uh, I don't know, many of you are too young to remember the Stanford episode, what happened in January 1987 at Stanford which became, in fact, a national debate that went on for months. It, ha it was debated on the McNeil Air News Hour, which is what PBS was before, uh, uh, back, back then, uh, on, on the network news shows, on debates around the country. Now, Stanley mentioned that Stanford had a Western Civ requirement through the 50s and the early 60s. And then he said that the, the professors just sort of lost confidence in it in the mid-60s. And that had to do with a lot with the Vietnam War uh, setting out. It had to do with the, the uh, prejudice against any prescriptive layout of the past. Sort of a student rebelliousness, student revolt happening on college campuses, especially as those first boomers were hitting the, the campus. But so they got rid of the Western Civ requirement in the mid-60s. I actually went back a couple of years ago. I was at Stanford. I looked at old catalogs from the, from the late 50s, early 60s, talking about the general ed requirements and the confidence with which they laid out Western civilization. It was such a positive thing presented to students. By the mid-60s, that had changed. They dropped it. And what they replaced it with was kind of a grab bag of different courses. And it wasn't working. And actually, there were complaints from graduate schools about Stanford undergraduates who'd gone there, who they said, they don't know, they don't know very much about you know, the, sort of the past 
the, the civilizational past. So Stanford actually reinstituted a course, and they called it Western Culture. Western Culture. And that was something of, the, of, of a similar thing, a little, a little more varied. And it was very popular through the 80s. And that course really was sort of Western Civ story. And that had a plot. It had a narrative, right? Jerusalem and Athens come together. They evolve through you know, Greece, Rome, and then migrates up into the medieval Europe, the church rises, the medieval period, Dante and Aquinas are the great representatives. There. It sort of migrates into the Renaissance, and then the Reformation, and then the Enlightenment, and then it travels to America. So there was, there was a story, I actually, I actually have a little, got a little paperback from the 50s called The Story of Civilization, all right? And it wanted, this, is, this is the story of the West, running through these different centers, and you had your set pieces in there that everyone would teach. Well, that in the mid-80s with the rise of, I'll just call it multiculturalism uh, for, for now. Uh, questioning, this is too narrow. It's too, the word back then was Eurocentric. Eurocentrism was, was the problem. They didn't talk about it as too white. It wasn't, uh, there was kind of a dead white male thing, but it's more Eurocentrism, and we need more non-Western materials. So in January, uh, Jesse Jackson, who had come off a pretty prominent presidential campaign in 1984, the Rainbow Coalition, it was called, and he had some success in, he actually, you know, part of that damaging the, Repub the, the Democrat ticket as insufficiently acknowledging, you know, the Mondale <laughs> ticket, insufficiently acknowledging the persons of color. And Jackson was gearing up for an 88 run. And so he came to Stanford because some of the students, mostly the Black Students Association leaders said, this is too white a course here. And Jackson came, he saw this is a, you know, this is an issue that can become a campaign issue. He led 500 students in a march around campus and the famous chant was, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western culture's got to go. So the target was, a general ed requirement in freshman year at Stanford. And the, a year later, it was kind of a local controversy, a year later, Richard Bernstein, the, the New York Times journalist, uh, got wind that the faculty had decided to concede. Okay, we're gonna get rid of Western cultures and we're gonna create a more multicultural requirement. And Bernstein wrote an article in the New York Times chronicling this, and that's when it exploded into a national story. In fact, I, I went back to the New York Times issue uh, when Stanley's book came out and looked at the original newspaper story. That same day in the New York Times, Jesse Jackson's uh, plank speech, his stump speech, was published in the New York Times. Each prominent candidate had a stump speech published in the Times for a few weeks there. And, and that, was, that was Jesse Jackson's day. I thought that was, that was quite, quite a coincidence. But so they dropped the Western Cultures course, which stands right, was very popular. It was one of the most popular courses on campus. And alumni loved the course as well. So they, but, but they, they scrapped it and they replaced it with a multicultural course, a variety of courses which could satisfy the freshman requirement. They called it Culture Ideas Values, CIV. That was, that was the, the name for it. Culture, ideas, values, CIV. And they started teaching the course. And the course had to have, okay, you have to have some non-Western materials, representation by women, authors, artists, thinkers of, of color, and so on. So a more diversity-based course. Six years later, so everyone remembers the Jesse Jackson March. That's, that's sort of one of the important moments in the culture wars as they hit American college campuses at that time. I'm gonna wrap up real fast. Uh, and what happened was the Stanford then had this course. Six years later, Stanford did its curriculum review and they surveyed the students. 72% said 
bad course, the Civ course. Bad, we don't like it. Why didn't they like it? They asked them. Not because it's multicultural or diverse. No, they were fine with that. What they said was, there's no coherence. There's, we, you look at these courses, little of this, little of that, little of that. It's like the Chinese menu thing. I'll have this, and I'll have this, and I'll have this. And they said it didn't cohere into any sense, sensible, you know, broad, no big picture. You know, big B, big P, no big picture here. If you made a big picture of some kind out of these diverse materials, that would have, that would have satisfied. But that was the problem. It wasn't coming together into a story. There's no story here. We just jump around this. Oh, well, I'll, I'll bring in some of this from this culture, some of this from this, some of this in this time. And so I think that is a lesson for us in the designing of our syllabi. In the literature courses, there should be some literary history that some structure within which all, all these pieces hang, more or less hang together. You know, you don't want to push it too far. But I mean, things like, you know, the progressive uh, literary critic, historians in the 1930s, they saw American literature as the story of progressive individual freedoms happening in America. And that you could fit all these works in there. Right? The Scarlet Letter is, you know, Puritan repression against the individual female will. Right? The, uh, uh, you know, Melville Benito, Frederick Douglass's narrative, uh, obviously, Emerson's self-reliance, you know, Thoreau going into the woods, all these things could be developed into a story of expanding recognition of First Amendment for everyone, that kind of thing. So th there was a story there. It was a progressive, as a left-wing story to it. Just something, th think about that when you put your, your syllabus together. Give the students the, the, some bigger, bigger picture.